Hey there, friends. I hope that you enjoy this episode of the Remembering and Reenchanting podcast as much as I enjoyed making it. I want to take a moment here at the beginning to extend a special offer, an invitation to you, our dear listeners, to join the Remembering course. Our next start date is going to be in the middle of March. This is a powerful, deeply moving, and for many people, transformational experience into the heart of colonization, climate change, family histories, ancestors, and so many other critical intersecting pieces. Just visit our website, Sequoia Samanvaya. All the information is in the link below. Listeners, this is a special Easter episode of the Remembering and Reenchanting podcast. Instead of a conversation with another remarkable person, this episode is more akin to an audio essay exploring a multi dimensional moment in our history and in our present when our understanding of time itself changed. I'm building here on my ongoing work around circular time and on remembering our histories in different ways. As you will see, this is all about Easter. I'm going to be going into aspects of some medieval European church history and their cosmovision far more deeply than I tend to do in the episodes of this podcast. There is also a written article variation of this podcast episode available on Medium. Check out the show notes for links to that article and many of the other references that are going to be in this episode. And whenever you may be listening to this podcast, I hope you enjoy it. Ostada, Ostada. The name is a remnant from a time before this time. And yet the name itself beckons, evokes, and summons, like a shaft of light in a dark room, when one is wondering yet again for how long the winter wind will howl. Usta, the goddess of the dawn. Our earliest written record of the goddess Estra was written about, quite briefly, of, by all people, a monk in the 8th century. And not just any monk, but Bede, the Venerable, writing in the kingdom of Northumbria in what is now England. He is sometimes referred to as the father of history in recognition of the extent to which his scholarship defined how we conceptualize and practice the discipline of history today. He is probably most famous for his book, The Ecclesiastical History of the English. It was in a subsequent book, The Reckoning with Time, in Latin, De Temporum Rationae, published in 725 AD, that he mentions this goddess in connection with the old British calendar month that we now think of as April. In Northumbrium, and I'm not entirely sure how this pronunciation was, but that would have sounded something like Ustermonop. In Old High German, Ustermanoth. Bede's entire book was about a pivotal event, the timing of Pascal, which was translated as Easter. Now, we don't know for sure why the church translated the Latin Pascal into Easter in English. Quite possibly, it was another moment of synchronism. The church leaned into a local tradition that is celebrating the dawn around the time of the spring equinox and overlaid it with their own celebration of the rise of Christ at a very similar time. 
It is also possible that the word Easter itself, with its roots meaning dawn, fit with the meaning of a risen Christ that the church was trying to convey. Whichever way, something quite remarkable occurred in the maintaining and the continuation of the name Easter. Basically, Easter, that old English dawn goddess, who herself has roots in an expansive proto-Indo-European tradition of dawn goddesses that we can trace back to Sanskrit Vedas in India, not only survived the coming of Christianity, which has become associated with what is, for many, the very essence of Christianity itself, the ritual celebration of the resurrection of Jesus into Christ, a celebration performed at dawn on Easter. In these intersections, time, the ancient, the past, the present, and the promise of a future life to come, seems to become not just linear or cyclical, but multidimensional. In our times, a time that is filled with a level of change that most scholars and pundits say is unprecedented, it feels entirely appropriate to look at both the goddess herself and this little book written by this mighty scholar of a monk that helped to preserve her name and was part of a larger process of her forgetting. At that time, in the early 8th century, a time that feels in many ways utterly foreign to our time in the second millennia, that also was a pivotal moment. A moment when time itself, the meaning of time and how humans relate to time, was changing. Perhaps in this exploration of go- both, of going in between the pagan and the Christian traditions, alongside with a dash of science and spiritual experiences, we can gain a better understanding of each. And perhaps we can also gain a better understanding itself. And then maybe through this process, all of us can contribute to our ability to work with our time now, in a time when certain aspects of time itself is actively changing. And this is also a time where different voices are advocating for different cosmovisions, struggling for their version of history and the correct meaning of the calendar to be seen as real. So in this podcast, I'm taking us on a journey into the past. It's really into multiple pasts. And it's for the purpose of better understanding the present, especially in better understanding how we are thinking about time, including the future. To do this, I start pretty far back. I'm going basically on a roughly linear trajectory over the course of this podcast, the millennia, starting with the millennia of animist traditions. I'm again going to go into ecclesiastical history. And this particular little book, which enabled the future calculations of the date of Easter, it's a hugely important piece of literature for our collective understanding of calendars and of time. And I then jump right into the present. I'm interweaving here some of my own experiences and a little bit of science and some other forms of commentary. And perhaps I would like to think that that is how time itself works. Some linearity, some cyclical patterns, and some multidimensionality. Okay, I'm going to start with the goddess. Ustra. Ustra, the English version of the goddess of the dawn, is part of a larger and older set of goddesses in the proto-Indo-European traditions that are associated with the coming of the day. They're generally referred to, just as you might imagine, as dawn goddesses. This pre-Christian Indo-European linguistic, cultural, and religious peoples, it is thought, started in probably northern India and moved slowly into influence settled and made their homes across Europe. Remnants of language, culture, and tradition remain in different parts of this vast area in different ways. As is so common in these really old deities, we see the form, in this case the form of the goddess of the dawn, in many variations and in many names. The commonalities between them beckon towards 
common human energetic and spiritual experience of the dawn. The Proto-Indo-European goddess Hoesos, literally the dawn, is believed to have been one of the most important deities worshipped by Proto-Indo-European speakers. She is consistently found in multiple traditions and cultures. In the Rig Veda, she is known as the Usas and is one of the most important goddesses. Her attributes have been intertwined with many other goddesses, including solar goddesses in later traditions, such as the Baltic sun deity Sale, who is seen to be responsible for all of life on earth. The deity associated with the dawn is almost also always associated with the feminine, which is somewhat unusual amongst the gods of that culture who tended to be masculine. The dawn goddess is associated with birth and rebirth, even of eternal rebirth. In the Iliad, she is Eos, born in the morning. She is often portrayed as unaging. The regularity of her rising leads her to be associated with stability, persistence, and order. Her name stems from the same word as our current word for east. You can hear that in the Oesta, east. She is known for her brightness and her radiance. Sometimes she is also referenced with the morning star or the day star, the first light. Almost always she is filled with bright radiance and persistence. She is often associated with the dawn of time, the beginning of life itself. She is associated with the colors of reds, pinks, golds, and other colors we might associate with the sunrise. No particular surprise there. Some say that she opens the gates at the beginning of the day for the sun to enter. Some say she is associated with horses or cattle who came across the sky carrying her chariot. In old Greek and Roman poetry, she's associated with rosy fingers and sometimes wears golden rings. While sometimes she may be hesitant to start the day, she is nonetheless reliable, dependable, and purposeful. Some associate the spring equinox with Ostara, although from what I've read, she is more often associated with the month of April, not the month of March, which is when the spring equinox occurs. Today, there is still much music dedicated to the dawn and to the morning star, especially in Baltic traditions. If you're looking for a playlist and a deeper dive into dawn goddesses, I suggest the Fair Folk podcast and Danica Boys' beautiful playlist. In the Vedic tradition, where the dawn goddess is called Usha, she is associated with the, initi- with the principle that initiates life. Here we see a strong connection with the beginning of any day and the beginning of time and the beginning of life itself. Her predictability is part of what gave her the character of the order of the day and also the law of the universe. Usha is generally depicted as one who imbues life into all beings and the life of all life and the breath of all breaths. She is revered as a deity who revivifies earth each day, drives away the chaos and the darkness, and sets all things in motion sending all living beings to do their duties. That's an incredible, incredible amount of responsibility. An incredibly beautiful deity. As is the dawn. When I consider her long history, when I consider her long history stretching at least back to ancient India and how natural it seems to have a deity of one of the most important times of the day, often balancing the deification of the coming of the night, I can't help but wonder just how old this deity is. Could it be that humans have been celebrating her in some form for as long as we have known ourselves to be human? I can't know for sure, but I think the wonder that I feel on those moments when I do watch the sunrise, which I have to admit is not exactly daily, and I think of that experience 
of just wonder and delight and graciousness. And I also can feel that sense of order, the slowness, the steadiness, the uniqueness of each daybreak brings a calmness and a joy into my heart, whether the day is looking difficult or wondrous. Today, Osta, Ostada, is one of the few memories of a goddess who lived in the time-space of dawn celebrations in April. These days, that time-space is currently primarily occupied, especially in Western cultures, by Pascal and Christ's resurrection. Of course, there are many kinds of memories. There are dances and songs and foods, folk tales and folk traditions. The rituals and churches that we know are part of pre-Christian traditions. There are many forms of remembering, and I believe that many people are remembering the importance of the dawn from many different traditions. When I think of rituals to celebrate her based on the rituals that have come before the, and the ones that I myself have done, I think of going to the top of a local hill, perhaps at Equinox or at Eastertide, facing east, the direction of the rising sun, and singing. For she is the first light, and how else do we celebrate the beginning of light, the beginning of the day, the beginning of life, the time that keeps rising, except through song? singing in the worship of the dawn, the actual dawn, and the metaphorical dawn, the internal experience of the dawn that rises within us. For in this goddess we see that precious human capacity to integrate the real and the metaphorical. We ourselves have this embodied fleshy world with actual sunrises, and we also have our inner landscapes with their invisible set of human emotions and needs and wants and desires and symbols and metaphors. In between the inner world and the outer world is the stuff of language, of meaning making, of community crafting, of culture creation, of world building. What if, especially at some point around the spring equinox, there was a particular energetic moment of rebirth that has been recognized by many spiritual traditions in the Northern Hemisphere. And in that somewhat unexpected survival, perhaps through the night and through the winter, this new light continues to beckon us. Oh, I can completely understand why our ancestors would want to deify that moment, that experience, that energy. And perhaps there is something that we too can learn through approaching this deity. Since that time, there are many stories about her. Perhaps most famous is that old folklorist Grimm. Maybe he heard some tales from a few locals in a German village in that oral tradition kind of way, where the story is both passed down but also made up and repeated exactly the same way each time, or something like that depending upon who you heard it from. In at least one version of this tale, which Grimm recorded, Ista had once saved a bird from the winter cold. The bird's wings had frozen and could not fly, so she changed the bird into a rabbit or perhaps a hare, whose warm winter coat helped her survive the winter. As the rabbit was once a bird, it could lay eggs. We have earlier stories, centuries earlier, linking eggs and rabbits and the spring equinox in Germanic and other European folklore. Based on the wider traditions throughout Europe and based on what little we know of English cultural and spiritual history pre-Christianity, is not too much of a stretch to say that she was revered in England both before the coming of Christianity and in many ways after Christianity began, but was in England a multi-century process of becoming the dominant cosmovision. Okay, so that's something about Ista and the goddess of the dawn. Now, let's go deeper into this different cosmovision, one which focuses on a new day and whose primary ritual, the ritual of Easter, is held at dawn, but one which dramatically changed the way in which time itself was understood. (laughs) 
I've been increasingly attending to the multi-century transition from indigenous European culture to a Christian culture and the gazillions implications that that has had for the people of Europe and for us today. It seems a particularly important moment in thinking about eco-spirituality, ecology, decolonization, culture, and what it means to be a spiritually grounded and deeply aligned in a rapidly changing political, economic, and climate changing world as we are in today. You might have listened to an earlier episode in a podcast in this podcast that I did on this topic with Professor Carol Cusack. Why don't consider this area to be my particular expertise, I have been able to put together a few big pieces. So let's start with some worldviews. What was the worldview that led to a monk to write a book such as The Reckoning with Time? The Christian author, C.S. Lewis, in his final book, The Discarded Image, an Introduction to Medieval and Renaissance Literature, does an impressive job of helping the more modern reader understand the medieval cosmovision. He points out that medieval culture was essentially bookish in character, and they had an intense love of system. Now, when Lewis says bookish, he is saying that the intellectual elite spent a lot of time with their books. Those images of monks bent over books engraved in the books that they themselves were reading, and sometimes also depicted in church windows and church statues. Well, That was an image that you might be familiar with, and it definitely depicted what they spent a lot of their time doing. I'm not sure if the copious amount of time that the modern elite spends on the internet is all that different. In both societies, our bodies are hunched forward, heads bowed, hands in front of us, looking into and actively co-creating a world that if you are not either reading books or if you are not on the internet and there actually are some people who are not on the internet, then you are just not a part of it. Lewis goes on to say that with a bookish character came a great need for order. Augustine, who played a big role in this really long story, essentially reframes what it is that is worth intellectuals and others who are engaged in this bookish culture to be thinking about. Maybe we could say that prior to that, there was one set of intellectual goals of pursuit, and Augustine changed the goals about the goal of thinking, learning, education, and learned discourse. In one of his most famous works, De Doctrina Christiana, he argues that Christian knowledge and scholarship is a means to a very particular end, the training of men to be preachers or teachers, actively to understand the word of God and to help people reach salvation. Augustine begins with a radical, and it's kind of hard to say how radical this was, division of knowledge into two categories, useful knowledge and useless knowledge. Christians did not need to know anything that was not useful to salvation. Now, useful is a huge category for Augustine. It entailed part of what was useful was understanding the system that God had put in order, the system in which the universe works. Humans get to participate in understanding, interpreting, and aligning human activity with that system. If you're a monk, a preacher, a member of the intellectual elite, you get to participate in this process. It was a collective activity spanning across nations to understand this system. As C.S. Lewis explains, all the apparent contradictions in the world must be harmonized. A model must be built which will get everything in without a clash, and it can do this only by becoming intricate and by mediating its unity through a great and finely ordered multiplicity. All of this was done, well, as you have imagined, I'm sure, through spending a great deal of time with books. Okay, So understanding the universe is a part of understanding the system that they thought would echo their version of God. Now, within that need, what is often think of as systematic theology is the practical and theological necessity to understand time, specifically how time is computated. Here's a next kind of part of the historical context of why Betty wrote this book.
Back then, the calendar didn't work particularly well enough to predict future dates in time. So let's just back up a bit and go to some of the pre-Christian history here. For most of recorded written European history, including during the Roman Empire, there was no universal or generic measurement of what year it was. Today, we are really used to years being numbered based on a particular start point. For us in the modern world, that is what used to be known as zero, the death of Christ, or in more secular parlance, the beginning of the common era. But back then, the year was determined by who the king or emperor was. Year three in the reign of Augustus, for example. That also meant that if you were outside of the Roman emperor, empire, you probably had a way of reckoning, recording what year it was based on your local king. If you were far enough away, and if someone told you that something happened in the year three of the reign of Augustus, you probably wouldn't have any clue what year they were talking about. In about 525 AD, Christians started using the term Anno Domini, which started the collective year count from Christ's birth. Theologically, this was because Christ reigned all of time, not just the comings and goings of kings and empires. So Christ's life governed the calendar. So from that point forward, if you were part of Christendom, whatever your little fiefdom or kingdom used to mark time in the past was taken over by this new system of reckoning with time. A new set of patterns came with it. This was particularly important for the growing networks of knowledge centers, abbeys, monasteries, churches, and all of their rituals, and of course, their libraries. The event around which everything else in the year turned, ah, yes, maybe you see this coming, was what they call Paschala. We now refer to this as Easter. The resurrection of Christ, which if we want to get into some Christian history was not actually recorded in the earliest written account that we have of the gospel, but that's a story for another time. It was seen as a central point around which the essence of Christianity and its distinction from other religions, including Judaism and other pagan traditions, was based. As the church developed its liturgy, the two months prior to the resurrection, including the celebration of Lent, became a critical part of its yearly rhythm. The church needed to be able to predict when Pascal would occur. Now, in the Muslim world, which have been celebrating Ramadan since 624 in the city of Medina, in what is today Saudi Arabia, which is basically a century before Bede was writing his book on time, there was also a need for a collective agreement about when to begin the holy month of Ramadan. Their solution was to base the holy month on the sighting of the new moon in a particular location, and then to tell everyone else that, yes, this moment has come, the sacred month has begun. They recognized some of the inaccuracies of human calendars and found a way around it based on a detailed observation of the sky. This tradition more or less continues today. It seems that at one point in the church, the Pope did something similar. However, communication channels between the churches were not always smooth, Plus, there was that need for advanced planning given the two months preparation prior to Easter. So for multiple reasons, from at least the third century, the church was looking for a way to determine the future dates of Easter in advance of their actual occurrence. And they needed a way of doing that that was they did not at that moment had. I'm just going to get into the weeds of this just a bit. The church determined that Easter would fall on the Sunday after the full moon that followed the spring equinox. There's a lot of reasons for that, and I'm not going to get into them right now. This required working with the solar cycle, the lunar cycle, and the weekly cycle. Not getting into the exact computations, but as you probably know, one of the challenges of putting together a successful calendar to predict the future is that the 13 lunar months do not precisely fit into a single solar calendar. People in medieval Europe were well aware of this. Many people had come up with different ways of calculating how the lunar and solar cycle might go, basically coming up with a long set of tables. But many of these tables proved inaccurate or highly cumbersome, or people were using different tables. As a result, churches in Alexandria and churches in Rome were celebrating Easter several days apart. This did not fit the desire for the system that Augustine was encouraging people to move into confusion was resulting. Okay, now, interbede. 
brilliant monk in the kingdom of Northumbria, supported by an abbot with a vast library and a wide network throughout the growing Christian world. So, Bede was in the midst of narrating and ordering his world according to a Christian cosmovision. To do so, he was engaging with time. First, history. And then, at least as important, the calendar. The calendar would enable this vast new religion spanning great distances, though not yet in what would become its full entirety, to function as a whole, to enact the same rituals at the same time as everyone else. The key question around which the debates and disagreements across Christendom around the timing of Pascal, what we now refer to Easter, and his treatise directly was responded to that, to that question. It's laying out practical and sacred workings of time, days and nights and lunar cycles, and he then goes into the way in which one can calculate Easter. On some level, what he did was actually quite simple. He took what he thought was the best of the different tables out there and then strengthened it and then explained how it all worked in a way that was easy for people to understand. Part of what he's doing is he's showing how this table and this particular way of thinking about time is a better representation, a better model, as Lewis would say, than some of the other versions out there. In order to do that, he's comparing different temporal cycles. He's including that of the Anglo-Saxon pagan tradition that his fellow monks were quickly uh, overtaking. There was a tradition that was fading into memory. And that's part of why he mentions Istra. It was a passing comment. It was not his main point. He once refers to the book, The Reckoning of Time, as our little book about the fleeting and wave-tossed course of time. It's probably one of the most influential books on measuring time and constructing the Christian calendar. It's tied deeply to the Christian cosmology that had already been put in place by thinkers like Augustine. And then he's bringing it together along with science and mathematics. The frame for this, the word they use for this, computus in Latin, has no real equivalent today. So, These monks figured out a way of creating a calendar that could predict Easter more accurately. They were only a couple of millennia behind the counterparts in Mesoamerica. The basics of the Mayan calendar, which was quite accurate, have been operational since at least the 5th century BC. Now, this could be seen as just a cool history of calendars that continues to influence us today, but something else was happening that one could easily miss, and that has to do with how they, and really how we, saw the future. Medieval scholar Faith Wallace, whose commentaries and translations I found immensely helpful in understanding Bede's work, writes about the significance of the shift. To project the dates of Easter is to project the future, to give names to years which have not yet been. This is a very unusual project for early medieval people. Neither Romans nor Germans had any prospective era. They could only name the years in the present and the past by reference to councils or kings. Computists not only thought about the years to come, but also counted and named them in the columns of their Pascal tables. In numbering the future and connecting those numbers to Pascal, to the resurrection of Christ, Bede elicits a bigger conversation. Another word for it today is planning. When Bede first put forward this book, there was a little bit of trepidation. What were the consequences of human beings placing names into the future? Was that appropriate? Did that knowledge bring us closer to the much-anticipated Day of Judgment? The authorities of the church needed to plan. That need to plan overcame whatever internal resistance there might have been to the human audacity of naming the future, which was surely in the realm of the divine. Bede was one of many who was eager to assuage his fellow intellectuals who preached to the common folk that the end of times and the coming storm between the Christ and the Antichrist was, based on a thorough exegesis combined with a careful set of astronomical calculations, quite a long way off. Nevertheless, in his final chapter of the book, Bede does something powerful. He goes into the end of times explicating upon the book of Revelations and upon certain sections of the book of Genesis to do so. The calendar he advocates for, with its inherent cycles, is one that, 
following what was at the time standard theology would end in a new dawn, a new dawn that would have no night that would follow it. In that time when the moon would shine as brightly as does the sun, when the when there was no need for night, and an eternal bright and sunny future that those who act piously now in this time can enjoy in their renewed and uncorrupted bodies. He was here elucidating a rather classical aspect of Christian theology, the book of Revelations. As he does so, something far bigger than a set of numbers emerged. Again, I turn to the scholar Faith Wallace. He writes, The purified eschatology at the last chapters of the reckoning of time also gives Bede an opportunity to do what no previous computist had ever attempted, to turn the reckoning of time a figure of eternity. The calculation of Easter merges into a meditation upon the last things, a spiritual exercise whose purpose was to rise through the contemplation of time to the perceptions of eternity. The final chapter brings the reckoning of time to a close by underscoring the book's essential character as a vision of eternity through time. Easter is thus a moment when a past event, the resurrection of Christ, a current event where the celebration of a congregation is now, and a future event, the second coming of Christ, are all blurred into a single moment. If you go deep enough, you can also touch upon the beginning of time itself, when, as the Gospel of John says, in the beginning the Word was with God. In that dawn, the beginning of time, the end of time, the time we are all right now, touch each other. I suspect that if the Easter ritual was done well, then for many that was a physical, somatic, spiritual experience in which they probably experience some ways in which all these different aspects of time were connected. The system, God's plan, has been explained. Some of the strangeness of the human experience and what was felt to the disjointedness of the church practicing its most important ritual on different days has been straightened out. A new order is possible. And in that order, there is a promise of an even better order in the day to come. For Bede, a better order was closely attached to an even more perfect stability. As Bede himself writes at the end of his book, and so our little book concerning the fleeting and wave-tossed course of time comes to a fitting end in eternal stability and stable eternity. Now, here's a little bit of irony, or at least a particularly strange thing that happened. And part of why I think this moment in time is so important, Bede, in in articulating a calendar that, in many ways, we continue to practice, was himself playing a key role at the end of one set of time and the beginning of another. Even as he wrote about the end of times, an event that he thought would happen in the far distant future with the second coming of Christ, he was enacting the very that very thing on a small scale in Northumbria. Bede himself lived in one of the first stone buildings ever raised in that part of England. He wrote under glass windows, which had not been known in that part of the country before, and which skill sets had to be brought over from France. His life and daily practice entailed using a technology, writing, that had not been part of the millennia of oral storytelling culture of the Celtic British peoples who preceded him. He learned writing, perhaps the equivalent of today's cell phones, growing up in the monastery. His teachers had also grown up learning to read and write. But most likely, neither his parents nor grandparents did, and certainly many of the common people all around the monastery in which he lived his days, would not have known how to use this technology. And the world he was living in, the world of Christendom, which his thinking and writing were helping to actively create and enact, not just observe and witness, was a world, a cosmovision that saw itself as part of a linear trajectory with a particular start date and a particular definable endpoint. It begins the beginning of time. It ends with the resurrection and renewal of all the world. To our knowledge, most of the pre-Christian traditions of Europe did not have this distinct sense of linear time intersecting with cyclical time. That linear sense of time 
continues to deeply, deeply impact modern society today. Okay, I'm going to take a quick pause here to talk about something a little bit different. Not all Christians are into the end of times. Let me just take the example from the community that I grew up in, unprogrammed Quakers. Quakers is a subsect of the incredibly wide and diverse religion that we think of as Christianity today. Quakers today, and certainly in the unprogrammed tradition that I grew up in, do not have this particular idea of the end of times as being particularly important, or even necessarily anything other than a symbolic and allegorical reality. The Quakerism I grew up practicing, and which continues to deeply shape myself and my theology and how I work in the world, makes no bold claims about life after death. Our general approach is that we don't know what's going to happen when you die. Heaven and hell are allegories, symbols of internal struggles and external realities in many people's lives today. Our attention is on this lifetime, not future ones. Nor was our attention on the second coming of Christ. Quakers also did away with all the holidays, Christmas, Lent, Easter, in favor of living simply every day. I did grow up with some of the past Easter celebrations that are far more pagan in origin. Painting eggs, hunting for Easter eggs, eating chocolate bunnies. These deep fertility symbols were quite likely associated with the goddess of the dawn. I suspect, though I can't know for sure, that the everlasting continuation of life that the eggs and the rabbits and the cows and the dawn symbolize for common folk traditions throughout Europe, and also symbolizing the continuation of the community, not just the body of the individual. That was a level of individualism that seems somewhat unique to Christianity, quite separate from the more collective ritual teachings within Passover and of Judaism as a whole. Bede himself does not, in this book, mention the cults that grew up around Mary, or the specific worship of the Virgin Mary around the bright morning star, the star that precedes the coming of life. I don't know if he knew about them, or if he knew how much of the rituals around Easter are so much older than even his long calendar sequence. I've yet to hear this God is associated with the end of times in the way that the resurrection of Christ is associated with the end of time. As I read Bede and consider the deep faith he had in the coming of the end of time, I found myself wondering, okay, so what do we know about the end of times these days? You know, from science. Myself, being a proper modern woman, I asked Google. According to my less than half a second search, the science is a bit uncertain. I love the title of an article from Scientific American titled, The Paradox of Time, Why It Can't Stop But Must. According to this article, the end of time is theoretically possible. Right now, observation points to continued expansion of the universe. Here's a quote. Time itself could end. All activity would cease, and there would be no renewal or recovery. The end of time would be the end of endings. If the universe ever stops expanding and starts contracting again, it would go into something like the Big Bang in reverse, the Big Crunch, and bring time crashing to a halt. Time needn't perish everywhere. Now, relativity says it expires inside black holes while carrying on in the universe at large. Black holes have a well-deserved reputation for destructiveness, but they are even worse than you might think. If you fell into one, you would not only be torn to shreds, but your remains would eventually hit a singularity at the center of the hole, and your timeline would end. No new life would emerge from your ashes. Your molecules would not get recycled. Like a character reaching the last page of a novel, you would not suffer mere death, but an existential apocalypse. Woo! Existential apocalypse. The big crunch. It could happen. Doesn't really sound like perpetual daylight, as described in the, by Bede, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe some beings in the universe escape the crunch and they just go on walking on a super long light beam? 
As physicists and mathematicians and others contemplate the end of time, they recognize that, so far as we know, the prerequisites of time is a prerequisite of our own existence. As the author of the article, George Musser, writes, the end of time may be something we can't imagine, but no one will ever experience it directly, any more than we can be fully conscious at the moment of our own death. Well, at any rate, according to the observations, we seem to be on a growth trend. We being the universe. Humans? Well, humans do seem to be able to keep growing. How long that continues remains debatable. Okay. So general theory of relativity and some experiments from way beyond this precious blue planet, such as in black holes, suggest that our experience with time, including days and nights, are not always the inevitable future for all of creation. Over 1,300 years after Bede's book, another Easter, Easter approaches. Thanks to a variation of the calendar system that Bede helped to develop, articulate, and teach to Europe According to Hallmark, this tradition is about Easter eggs and chocolate bunnies. Consumer spending on Easter in America in 2024 is expected to be around $22.4 billion. $3.1 billion of that is geared towards candy. In some ways, it's a stark difference from Bede's world, where chocolate was not yet known. In other ways, it has some similarities. For most of the common people, the Easter sunrise service was followed by large feasts, a particularly welcome occasion after the season of Lent, which coincidentally included eating no eggs. Once again, you could have the eggs that you have been storing up all during the past few weeks. These days, my own style of writing, a blue lit screen with so much knowledge about the physics of time that my computer clock changes from daylight savings automatically, even as my body remains a bit confused by the suddenly longer days, is indicative of a technological world utterly foreign to my medieval English ancestors. I sit on a continent that Bede had no idea existed. An assemblage of rocks in my pockets is fastened together in such a way that I receive minute-by-minute -minute updates from people in places much further away than Alexandria. I live in a world both a time and a place that Bede could not have imagined. And yet here I am reading his translated words, finding a resonance in his desire of ordering his world and understanding both the past and the future. We too wonder about time. We too are in the midst of a reckoning with time. Not in the way that Bede would, not in the sense of wondering what the calendar is or how to tell the next future. If anything, we have become incredibly good at planning. We're also incredibly good at thinking that we can plan at all, that question that was at that point a question has ceased to be a question. Now, today's reckoning of time entails a reckoning with things past. The legacies of colonization leads to, amongst a myriad of social and economic challenges, climate change. The seasons themselves are changing, though the planetary motions that Bede and the billions of sky-watching people all around the world before him have been observing have not. Thank goodness. We are in the midst of a reckoning of a story, a story about our cosmovision. What is our place in the cosmos? Our most dominant ways of thinking about our place is faltering, flailing. A reckoning with the meaning of times and places and the patterns in which we live our lives. A reckoning about continued aspects of unveiling, multiple dimensions of variations of apocalypses, the Anthropocene age. The prophets of science are dire and grim. Other prophecies from other cosmovisions are uncertain. Much is possible. The stakes are high. It's risky. Very risky. The prophets of doom today, speaking not only from biblical references, but from the studies of rocks and air and particles and storms. And that old biblical story of the Christ and the Antichrist is still very much alive. The very real potential for Armageddon seems to have only increased. That old song comes to mind. Are you more surprised at how things change or at how they stay the same? As in Bede's time, we need to reconsider our relationship with time and place and with the cosmovisions that we are enacting in our calendars and in our holidays, in our planning, monitoring, evaluating, in our daily scheduling. Augustine set forth a purpose 
for the many new monks and others who would be focusing on learning. It was a purpose that combined what we now think of as science and art and spirituality, and that we had a clear goal, in this his case enabling what he saw to be salvation. The calendar was devised to enable the ritual and practical enactment of that cosmovision. Lives, patterns, structures, all of it came out of that. Knowledge was both honed and forgotten accordingly. What theologies, I think we might want to ask ourselves, are our calendars enabling today? What higher purpose are our cosmovisions enabling? And how are we enacting them and how we construct our collective calendars, not just our individual ones? As a friend, student, co-thinker, Andrew Dunn said to me in a recent conversation, what's the liturgical calendar for regenerative economic systems? I ask these questions alongside my co-participants and co-creators in a lot of my work around circular time. Part of our work is to reconnect time and place for colonization has unmoored too many of us. The role of Christianity, that process is complex and really far too nuanced a question for this podcast. Some of us are seeking ways of returning to older and perhaps hopefully more sustainable ways of knowing and being, of patterning our lives. We are attempting to re-enchant a disconnected and distracted world, to return to cyclical rhythms and circular calendars. I'm sure Bede would have approved of that part. We're also wandering and wandering into the deities that Bede noted and moved on from. Deities and energies that perhaps seem less concerned with the end of time and more with his cyclical continuation. Amidst dozens of reckonings, amidst people filled with grief and confusion of death tolls and genocides and extinctions, we need that age-old promise of the dawn. We need the promise, the reality of renewal. Now I like to think that the two deities, the goddess of the dawn and the risen son of Mary, are good friends, perhaps the way an auntie and a nephew might be, perhaps not always in agreement about everything, but walking together, celebrating the inner, outer wonders of light and new beginnings. Maybe it's not always about the so-called pagan versus Christian worldview. Maybe it's about a celebration of life and the promise of more life to come. Okay, so Bede would probably think I missed the whole point. But in our world today, I know far too many followers of Jesus who are also deeply animist and who hear goddesses as well as the son of Mary. And the Jesus whom I have encountered is a wild God. When he was buried in the cave by the woman, he was re-entering the great mother. And as my friend, the Mennonite pastor Katerina Gia once preached, the beings who witnessed his transformation first were the stones of earth herself. Perhaps on that time that we call Easter morning, that ancient maiden goddess and the Son of God walked together, nine months before the winter solstice. In it, the promise of continued fertility, the promise of a new day, a moment we need now as much as we did then. Maybe you too are watching for the shaft of light under the door amidst the storm, for the goddess of the dawn. May the blessings of Easter, of a goddess and or the son of a god, of a woman named Mary, rise upon you, and within you, and in all of creation. And that brings us to the end of this special episode about Easter and time. Thank you, dear listeners, for your time and attention and paying attention to this episode. If you have appreciated this episode, please do like us and give us a high rating. It really does make a difference. I also have a written variation of this episode that is available on Medium. The link to that article, as well as to other material that I am referencing, is in the show notes. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with me about our courses on remembering circular time, eco-spirituality, and on finding other ways that we might want to work together. Again, thank you for listening 
to the Remembering and Reenchanting podcast.